Well, good evening, morning, afternoon. You know, whenever you're, whenever you're viewing this, um, I um, several of you have asked about my trip, the uh, the vacation that the family and I took with some of our friends and their children from Greenback. It it was good. Uh, of course, we had we had seven kids in the house, six adults. So it was a lot. We didn't leave much. It was the beach, which wasn't very crowded. We had our own pool in the back. Uh, yes, I had my fair fair share of some shrimp. Uh, I love shrimp. I like it just about any way you can give it to me. Um, so we had a good week. I feel kind of rested, I guess. Um, stopped at a bookstore on the way down and got some books I'm excited about. So I saw, couple of which are going to help in this class on holy habits and so I um, I hope I hope to kind of integrate some of that in as we go all right well uh, we we need to get going here uh, there's uh, some information we need to cover tonight and, and certainly some encouragement as well uh, but for those of you that are just jumping on here for the first time this is what we're talking about we're talking about holy habits, spiritual disciplines, uh, in fulfilling God's purpose for his people. We said that purpose is, in fact, uh, transformation into the likeness of Jesus Christ. There are certain th things that we can do that position us and aid us uh, to be transformed from the inside out. Uh, here is an overview of what we're going to specifically talk about in this class. Uh, and so you kind of have a review and preview here. Right now we're talking about scripture study, Bible intake. And uh, last week we talked about ingesting God's word. So we're kind of, you know, uh, Jesus, whenever he was tempted by uh, Satan, uh, he quotes from Deuteronomy 8 and says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That just as you got to eat food in order to survive and thrive physically, you've got to ingest God's word to survive and thrive spiritually. And so we said here are the two ways in which we ingest God's word. We get it into us. That's through hearing it and reading it. And we... Um, we looked at scripture and um, gave some practical thoughts along those lines uh, last week. This week, we're going to begin talking about digestion. Um, here are two means of digesting God's Word that we're going to talk about. Uh, we'll be talking about studying God's Word in this lesson, and we'll talk about meditating on God's Word in the next lesson. Others would add things like memorizing God's Word. They'll have some other things that they might add here. But these are the two main ones that I want to that I want to highlight. You could say that studying God's Word is more analytical, whereas meditating on God's Word is more devotional. But there's certainly going to be overlap there. But we need to, I think, underscore that both studying the Bible and meditating on God's Word allow us to move deeper in our understanding of and involvement with God's Word, all of which uh, will take us further down the road to becoming more like uh, the, the Son of God. Here is a, an illustration that D.S. Whitney provided in his, um, sorry about that, in his book that I've, that's that been of, of, of immense help to me, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. And in commenting on studying God's Word, here is what D.S. Whitney writes. He says, if reading the Bible, okay, just ingesting it, can be compared to cruising the width of a clear, sparkling lake in a motorboat, studying the Bible is like crossing that same lake in a glass-bottomed boat. The motorboat crossing provides an overview of the lake and a swift passing view of its depths. The glass bottom boat of study, however, takes you beneath the surface of Scripture for an unhurried look 
of clarity and detail that's normally missed, he writes, by those who simply read the text. So we might say reading gives us breath, but studying gives us depth. Now, not a few sermons um, that you've probably heard or classes that have been taught on studying your Bible uh, will quote 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, especially if the teacher is using the King James Version. And the reason for this is obvious. Uh, you'll note in uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 in the KJV Version, the text says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But I want you to notice a couple other translations, and you'll notice a, a slight difference. Here's the ESV. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And then the New American Standard Bible has be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth truth. So I want you to know that behind the KJV's English word study is the idea of doing your best, of being diligent. We might even say being disciplined to excel as God's workman. Now Paul is talking to Timothy here, an evangelist in Ephesus, but the principles here stand true for all of God's people. And such a pursuit involves one's careful handling of Scripture. What I find interesting about 2 Timothy 2.15 is it is clear that God places a high priority and high expectations when it comes to understanding and applying the word of truth. Uh, all Christians, all of us should desire to stand before God approved and unashamed. And if that's what we desire, then we will not be lazy or apathetic in our study of Scripture. I want to highlight both an Old Testament and a New Testament example of a heart to study. From the Old Testament, let's consider Ezra. For Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Um, there is a sort of an instructive sequence here. Notice first, he set his heart. Second, to study the word of the Lord. Third, to do it. And then finally, in the fourth place, to teach it to others. So, before he taught the word of God to others, he practiced what he had learned. But Ezra's learning came from a study of the scriptures, but before he studied, the text says he set his heart to study. In other words, Ezra disciplined himself to study God's word. From the New Testament, let's take the apostle Paul. Here's an interesting passage uh, he was in prison, and he's writing, from what we can gather, the last chapter of his final New Testament letter. And he's anticipating the arrival of Timothy, his younger friend, uh, his son in the faith. And here's what Paul says to him. When you come, bring the cloak that I left uh, with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. Now, I realize that there could be some speculation involved here, but there's what were these books, these scrolls, these parchments? Isn't it, isn't it quite possible, if not most plausible, to suggest that among those scrolls and parchments, some of that could have been writing material, some of that certainly reading or studying material, and it's hard not to imagine that among the things that Paul desires is some copies of God's Word, of Scripture. So he, he's asking for a cloak, right, that he can keep his body warm. But at the same time, 
He's wanting God's Word to study so that his heart and his mind can be warmed. You know, Paul, if you think back over his life at this point, uh, if we, and I think it's best to see that Paul's talking about himself in 2 Corinthians 12, about this person that got caught up into what he calls the third heaven, okay, which appears to be heaven itself. He gets an amazing journey or vision there. We know that Paul saw the resurrected Christ in Acts 9, 5. We know that he, through the Holy Spirit's power, was not only able to work miracles, incredible miracles, but to write scripture. I mean, this guy, Paul, had had experienced some extraordinary things, but nevertheless, he continued to study God's word until he died. If Paul needed to study God's word, surely you and I need to study it and should discipline ourselves to do it. So hopefully that's enough push here, right? Enough encouragement for you and I to take seriously the spiritual discipline of Scripture study. Now, um, why don't we, though? Why, why do so many Christians neglect a serious study of God's Word, a serious personal study of God's Word? Um, here's what R.C. Sproul said. He says, and I'll bring this up so you can see it a little bit bigger. Here then is the real problem of our negligence. We fail in our duty to study God's Word, not so much because it's difficult to understand, not so much because it is dull and boring, but because it is work. The problem is not a lack of intelligence or a lack of passion. The problem is that we are lazy. I mean, that, um, that could sum it up, right? I mean, maybe the reason why it doesn't get done in our lives is because we're lazy. Some of us would argue, no, it's not because I'm lazy, it's because I'm too busy. And we have discussed even up to this point, there's a sense in which a lot of these spiritual disciplines are going to kind of coalesce in that time that you were supposed to pick last week, right, that you and I were to pick, that, that, that setting aside that time uh, on a daily basis, um, taking those retreats when you can, um, doing what you have to do uh, to make this practice of studying and silence and solitude, and we'll talk about prayer and all this, uh, to, to engage God's Word. Um, besides laziness, besides perhaps too busy, um, for some, if not many, reason why they neglect it, it could be because of an insecurity about how to study the Bible or even where to begin. Now, there are a lot of books out there. This is just a sampling of some books that I've got in my library uh, that you might want to check out. The one in the very middle here is kind of more on a college level. It's one that I worked through with the class that we did here at Peace Street entitled, you know, How to Study Your Bible. Uh, so we have, we have dealt with some of the content, and it is involved, and, and it goes probably a little bit further than most of you would, would ever want to go, perhaps, uh, but it's a good one. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner there is a book by Rick Warren, Bible Study Methods. And he just goes through uh, 10 or 12, can't remember which, uh, different methods of way you can kind of dig into Scripture and study it. Okay, He's got, you know, from a character to a theme. Uh, he just gives you some tips and some tools uh, to kind of get you, get you started on that. So... Listen, there are books thick and thin that abound on how to study the Bible. Uh, they can provide more guidance regarding methods and tools than I can in this one lesson. But I do want to highlight something that Whitney said in his book that I think is, is, is good. He said, the basic difference between reading your Bible and studying your Bible is simply a pen and paper or some other means of preserving your thoughts. Um. It's about getting tactile, right, and writing 
you know, kind of charting what you're learning and conclusions, your questions you're asking and um, th- outlining, uh, you know, scripture and things of this nature. So personal Bible study, I think, should be inductive. That means it's about your thoughts. It's about your observations. It's about your insights and your discoveries. Uh, you know, in, in that sense, don't settle for spiritual food. And this is going to sound gross, but spiritual food that's been pre-digested by others. You know, there's others that have been studying and they've been record, writing books, writing booklets, writing articles. And all those can be good. And I'm going to say, you know, read those things. I do, I do right? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm using a book here along with Scripture to kind of help us think through some of these things. Here's some books I've used. Um, but this, this time of study, personal Bible study, is about your discoveries. Um, by disciplining yourself to study the Bible for yourself, you will experience over time the joy of discovering biblical insights and making certain connections and correlations firsthand. And the connections that you make are going to stick with you far longer than connections that others made for you. That's just how this works. Um, the book in the upper left-hand corner here that I've got on the screen uh, by K. Arthur, David Arthur, Pete DeLacy, uh, it, this is really the one of the latest editions of a book that K. Arthur put out years ago, How to Study Your Bible. And it it gives, in some detail, three basic parts of inductive Bible study. And I just want to, as we're kind of bringing this lesson to a close, I, I want to go through those very briefly. They'll provide you with some preliminary tools and truths, okay, um, that um, that you can use and kind of equip you for your own study of the Bible. And before we look at those three sort of basics here, I want to, I don't know if I can get this in front of you or not, but here is a, here's a big old Bible. It's called the International Inductive Study Bible. This happens to be the new international version. It comes in other versions, I believe, and this is actually a hardback. But the reason why I'm showing this to you is because, you know, like here in Matthew, and I know that may be hard to see, but this, they'll give you charts and, and they'll give you tips for reading and studying and all that at the start of each book of the Bible. But they give you a lot of blanks, okay? They'll have you go through, they'll give you, you know how a lot of your, the Bibles that uh, you would get, like here's me, SV, it has all the headings written in there and breaks down the paragraphs and kind of gives you a little idea of what it's about. This Bible doesn't come with that. It gives you blanks and it's saying you get to fill in the blanks. As you read and kind of get a feel for this narrative or for what God's saying through his writer here, record that and they give you a section to write down key words you saw and I mean it, it just it's a it's it's like a big Bible workbook that encourages inductive Bible study and that that inductive Bible study is kind of the basis for a lot of these personal Bible study books that you come across so here's the three basics of Bible study okay the first one is observation. Observation. And essentially you're looking to discover what is the text saying. You're going to do the work of reading a book several times. Um, reading comes first, okay? You get a get the lay of the land and then you start to slow down, kind of in the glass bottom boat. And you start to note connections and and, and other details, uh, it's it's just simply answering the question, what does the passage say? Um, well, at least one of several questions. Well, you'll see that in just a moment. But it's the foundation that must be laid. Uh, it's about really, sometimes people come up with interpretations and applications of Scripture that just aren't there because they didn't read it. They didn't observe what the text actually was saying and, and the context of this or that. You know, have you ever read a book of the Bible or read a passage 
and then you know once you get done you you can't recall what in the world you just read you know it's just left you um sometimes it's because we're not really reacting to the text we're not asking questions of the text we're not concentrating on the text maybe we just don't believe it's possible for us to understand what we've read so we just read it just just to do just to do it uh, maybe we're like, hey, you know, we're just going to wait on the preacher to preach on that one day to tell us what to believe. Well, perhaps that's been your attitude or you know people like that. But um, oftentimes people um, oftentimes people just don't know what to look for in the text. They don't know what questions to ask of the text. So observation comes down to really asking the five W's and an H. And we all are familiar, I think, with the five W's and the H. Who, what, when, where, why, how. Okay? So you, one of the ways to effectively study and, and really dive into a study of the Bible is if it's pen and paper, if it's computer or whatever, whatever means you're going to use to kind of record your thoughts and your observations and whatever, it's about asking questions of the text. And answering, finding answers to those questions. You know, who wrote this? Okay, basically, who who said that? Who are the major characters? Uh, some of this stuff doesn't have to be written down. It's just make sure you're observing these things. Uh, who are the people mentioned? Whom is the author speaking? Who was this written to? Right? About whom is he speaking? And you got what questions? What are the main events? Uh, what are the major ideas? What are the major teachings? What are these people like? What does he talk about the most? Uh, what is his purpose in saying that? I mean, a big part of studying Scripture is asking questions and asking, frankly, some of the right questions. When was it written? When did this event take place? When will it happen? When did he or she, she say this or that? When did he or she do it? Where was this done? Where was this said? Where will it happen? Where did this take place? Why? You know, why did this um, happen? Why was there a need for this to be written? What is the, you know, what is the purpose of this? So, and then how? How did it happen? How is it supposed to be done? How is this truth illustrated? How are they to do this or that? And so, you know, and sometimes we just naturally do this. We're reading, we don't understand something, a question comes to mind, we go back and we try to make a connection, or it might take us to some other passages and and, uh, but studying lots of times is asking questions and then finding the answers to those questions and putting those things together and, and observing the text as closely as possible. The second sort of basic thing is um, interpretation, discover what it means. And, you know, just as there are tons of books on how to study your Bible, there are tons of books on how to interpret your Bible are the big scary word hermeneutics, which is the sort of the science and art of interpretation of literature in general, but then many times the focus of hermeneutics is on the interpretation of scripture. And it answers the question, what does the passage mean? And I'll tell you this, the basis for accurate interpretation is careful observation. Um, if you rush into interpretation uh, without laying the vital foundation of accurate observation, your understanding will likely be colored by your presuppositions, you know, what you think, what you feel, or what other people said, rather than what God's Word has actually said. So you've got to make a lot of connections. You're observing, you're you know, you're making notes about what this passage is, is saying and, and you're going through all of this and making connections and correlations and you're reacting to the text and asking questions of the text and you're, you're, you're laying this very strong foundation for interpretation. Um, you know, interpretation is not always necessarily a step from observation. Um, let me illustrate. Uh, many truths, by the way, of God's Word are easy to discover and are immediately apparent. For instance, Paul's words in Philippians 2, 3, and 4, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility 
count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You know, um, he's writing this to Christians in Philippi. He's calling them to a certain mindset, a certain disposition of heart. And I don't think any of us have any trouble figuring out what Paul is saying and what that means for us today. Nevertheless, interpreting a passage of Scripture can become more involved, especially when there is a rather wide river to cross between there and then and here and now. Uh, this is... Um, it, this is where the use of Bible dictionaries, Bible encyclopedias, uh, other background resources can aid you in your understanding of the historical, cultural context. I'll give an example. You know, in the Old Testament, God did tell his people, the Israelites, to destroy the Canaanites. Okay, that's in your Bible, all right, as we would say. But does that mean that God is calling us to go find these people called the Canaanites and slaughter them? No. you got to look at the context of that. That's important. Um, that's a rather dramatic example, but there are other places where that's true. And I, th I think most people understand this principle that um, we, we have to kind of measure how wide that river is between then and there, here and now, and then build, as grasping God's word, Duval and Hayes say, kind of a bridge to where we are today. It's also important to pay attention to the literary context. So, for instance, Acts, the book of Acts, is an historical, you might, some would say, theological narrative, uh, but it, it has history, okay? It's telling us about the ex growth and expansion of the first century church from sort of its beginning there, uh, all you know, starting in Jerusalem, Samaria, the other, other part, most parts of the world. And you're going to read that and interpret that and deal with that differently than you would the book of Revelation, which is a highly vision oriented, symbolic, apocalyptic writing. Okay? One of the other things, um, the sermon this morning, we took it from Proverbs. Proverbial wisdom should not be viewed as unalterable axioms, right? Um, there are a lot of promises made, things stated in the book of Proverbs to which you and I could find exceptions. What does that mean? That God's word's not true. Well, you've got to understand proverbial wisdom. You've got to understand something about the genre. And then figurative language. We should expect to find some figurative language in the Psalms. So when it talks about the hills skipping like rams, uh, we ought not picture literal hills skipping like rams. Okay, It's using poet, poetic figurative language to describe uh, perhaps a certain phenomenon. So these are just some of the things, basic, basic things to kind of keep in mind as you, as you study God's Word. And one other thing is pay and this goes back kind of full circle, pay very close attention to the immediate context of your passage. For instance, some have applied uh, the injunction of Colossians 2.21, which reads, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, to prohibit just about everything imaginable. You know, they just rip that passage right out of, out of the book of Colossians, out of its context, and use it to forbid or to prohibit certain actions. And while there may be good reasons to abstain from some of the things this verse has been used against, the text is misapplied when used that way because its meaning is misunderstood. See, when taken in context, this do not handle, do not taste, do do not touch. It's clear in context that these words were actually the slogans of an ascetic group of, of people that the Apostle Paul was in fact denouncing as an enemy of the gospel. So pay attention to the context of individual verses. Check cross-references. It can be helpful. And a lot of Bibles have your cross-reference. There's some good Bibles, some good cross-reference to kind of get you 
looking at a theme or a thought or a teaching across multiple books, across the Bible, and that'll make sure that you're able to interact with all that God has said on a particular matter. It'll also prevent you, for instance, from allowing one passage of Scripture to contradict another passage of Scripture. I affirm that the Bible will harmonize. And uh, though there may be some alleged or apparent discrepancies, there are some plausible responses to alleged discrepancies that folks sometimes bring to the table. Thing is, as you advance in your study of Scripture, you're going to learn the value of more in-depth word studies and character studies and topical studies and other things. Uh, one of the best ways to begin a serious study of the Bible is to outline every book in the Bible chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph, recording your work as you go. Um, you, because whenever you're reading a passage of Scripture, like a paragraph of Scripture, and you know that I'm going to try, I'm, I am um, disciplining myself to summarize in a phrase or a sentence or a few words what this paragraph is about, you really find yourself concentrating more, responding to it more, thinking about it more, meditating on it more, and in order to come up with your sort of synopsis of what this is trying to communicate. Um, there are, I, I've been asked in one of my graduate classes, and I talked about this in How to Study Your Bible, but we went and we actually provided a headline for every single sentence in First Peter. Now think about that. You go to every sentence and go, okay, how would I put this in as few words as possible, but yet communicate its meaning? That's an interesting way to study your Bible. But, man, it is highly profitable. So here's the last little thing here, um, application. Discover how it works. It answers the question of how does this, how does the meaning of this passage apply to me? And so often, that's what we want to know, right, when we first come to Bible study. But proper application begins with carefully observing what's there, what it's, what's being said, and then moving to say, okay, now what does this mean, all right? What is, what is being communicated through what's being said? And then to apply that to, to our lives. You know, once you know what a passage means... You're not only responsible for putting it into practice. We are not only responsible for that, but we are accountable if we don't. Bible study without application removes us from the process, and it reduces our study to an academic exercise, something that was strongly condemned by Jesus. As we've looked in a previous lesson he wants us to hear his word, yes. He wants us to read his word, but he wants us to do it as well. And that is a, um, I mean, that is a theme. Um, I think about what he said in, in John 13, 17 to his disciples. He said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So application takes place that when we're confronted with a truth from God, an admonition from God that is applicable to us, and then we decide to respond in obedience to that. Ultimately, the goal of personal Bible study, as we've already discussed, is a transformed life. And that's what Edwin Jones uh, he taught at the School of Preaching in East Tennessee for a number of years. Uh, I like this quote from him. Bible study isn't just about skillfully arriving at truth. Neither is it just about doing good deeds in faith. Bible study is about becoming like God's son. Transformation. And again, that's something we're wanting to keep in front of us throughout all of this and all of our discussion of the spiritual disciplines. And as I mentioned, next week we are going to look at meditating on God's Word and uh, thinking about what that is and what it isn't. And I'm going to have several, uh, 
several sort of methods that you could use in meditating on Scripture that I think will be practical and helpful. Now, I want to close with a... um, I mean, I feel like I've closed closed a few times, but I do want to read this to you uh, by Jeffrey Thomas. He was a Welsh preacher from some time ago. He wrote a little booklet called Reading the Bible, and this is quoted in the very end of uh, Whitney's chapter on hearing, reading, and studying God's Word. And I just I want to share this with you because I think there's a lot of wisdom in this, uh, and certainly experience in in uh, studying God's word, and reading God's word, and it, and it just I think gives you a realistic picture of what you can expect as you begin to engage in your own personal study. Here's what he wrote: Do not expect to master the Bible in a day or a month or year. Rather Expect often to be puzzled by its contents. It is not all equally clear. Great men of God often feel like absolute novices when they read the Word. Apostle Peter said that there were some things hard to understand in the epistles of Paul, 2 Peter 3, verse 16. Um, Thomas writes, I'm glad he wrote those words because I have felt that often. So do not expect always to get an emotional charge or a feeling of quiet peace when you read the Bible. By the grace of God, you may expect that to be a frequent experience, but often you will get no emotional response at all. Let the Word break over your heart and mind again and again as the years go by. And imperceptibly, There will come great changes in your attitude and outlook and conduct. You will probably be the last to recognize these. Often you will feel very, very small because increasingly the God of the Bible will become to you wonderfully great. So go on reading it until you can read no longer. And then you will not need the Bible anymore because when your eyes close for the last time in death, never again to read the Word of God in Scripture, you will open them to the Word of God in the flesh. That same Jesus of the Bible, whom you have known for so long, standing before you to take you forever to his eternal home. Now we might quibble about a few of the things that Thomas says in in this, but but I like the sentiments. And I pray that those will be of encouragement to you and, and kind of help your perspective as you engage in your own personal study of God's Word. Thanks for, for hanging in there. I know this one was uh, rather long, uh, but I can promise you it could have been a lot longer. But that's all we're going to say about studying God's Word. We'll talk about meditating on God's Word next week. God bless you guys.